And today we have Katie, and Katie is going to talk about lattice models as for career pairings. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much, Slava. Um, and a special thanks to my advisor, Ben, for pressuring me to do this talk. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to talk about lattice models as Poincaré pairings, alternate title, everything is geometry, or yet another interpretation of the lattice models for Whitaker functions. Um, ben will probably also say I'm not tooting my own horn enough, but um, I think of this as sort of like none, none of the things I'm going to present are like super new things. They're just sort of my assimilation and like combination of a lot of interesting, uh, interesting math and pictures. Okay, so oh, I forget it's in presentation mode, so I have my um, laser pointer. Uh, so an outline of what we're going to uh, talk about today. So first, um, we'll just be like a bird's eye view, like overview of this correspondence between uh, bases and integrable systems, so like lattice models, uh, piadic representation theory and um, equivariant cohomology. Um, I guess the piadic representation theory will come more in at the end, but um, just a little bit of overview. Um, and then as much equivariant geometry as we need uh, to get through the rest of the talk. Um, and then we'll do two examples that if you've been attending the seminar, you've seen the lattice models already. Uh, the first is the frozen pipes model for um, Schubert polynomials. Um, the model also, you know, encapsulates um, uh, Grotendieck polynomials, but we're just going to focus on the easier case of Schubert polynomials for illustration. Um, and I'll explain where uh, these, what these pictures mean that I like to draw. Um, the quick answer right now is that um, this is sort of depicting like a lattice model as, you know, a square in this case. Um, and we think of this blue shaded region, if the top boundary is um, unspecified, this is representing the class of um, a fixed point in geometry expanded into Schubert classes. And then when you, you know, pick your boundary, you're like pairing with that Schubert class. Oh. Um, and then we'll get to the second example, which is, um, the colored and uncolored Whitaker lattice models that again, we've already seen if you've been in the seminar, but if not, um, that's okay. Um, and we'll have similar, but like, but different um, pictures for those as well. You can already sort of see that, you know, okay, it's a similar idea where we're like pairing with a vector, but um, there are different aspects. I mean, the first one is that, you know, it's a rectangle instead of a square, but <laughs> um, other aspects as well. And then lastly, uh, speculate about some future directions. Um, I put a question mark here, um, partially because I um, am sort of curious if any of the experts in the audience have, you know, ideas about how to like leverage this perspective. I would love to hear them. Okay, um, so first is our bird's eye view of this correspondence uh, for, um, we'll get to piadic representation theory at the end, but for now, just like this correspondence between Schubert calculus and integrable systems. Um, and so I sort of always have this like picture of this uh, cube in my head that um, this, you know, un uncolored picture, um, comes from a uh, survey article by Romani about H deformed Schubert calculus in equivariant cohomology, K theory, and elliptic cohomology. Um, and I decorated it to sort of uh, show like the correspondence with the geometric things and the, you know, what happens in the corresponding lattice model. Um, so the idea here is that there are three orthogonal directions to generalize classical Schubert calculus, which is over in this uh, bottom left corner where we're looking at the cohomology of um, uh, uh, homogeneous space X, usually just a flag variety. Um, and so from there, we can branch out and um, 
three directions pictured here, not pictured here, you could also generalize to quantum Schubert calculus. Um, but so going to the right, we can increase um, or like generalize the cohomology theory, bump it up to K theory or connective K theory, um, or even further to elliptic cohomology, which I won't talk about at all and don't really know much about. So that's probably a good idea. Um, if we go back in the cube, um, we that's going towards um, equivariant theories. Um, and if we go up, um, that corresponds to taking the cotangent bundle of the flag variety and then taking cohomology. Um, so in lattice model world, this like bottom um, bottom face. Uh, where, you know, we're just with the regular flag variety, not its cotangent bundle, um, corresponds to five vertex models, uh, usually. And then if you bump it up to the cotangent bundle, that's when you get the six vertex models. Um, and so, and the front face in purple is for the non-equivariant theories, and that uh, usually corresponds to one, having one set of spectral parameters for your model. Um, so maybe some row parameters. Um, and for the equivariant theories, you have usually two sets of spectral parameters. So this is sort of the universe I, I, I think about as a way to organize this. So, um, and then another um, sort of schematic from that paper of Romani, um, there, um, just in more mathy terms, what is this correspondence? Well, there's uh, this general theme of like in generalized equivariant cohomology, whether that be regular cohomology, K theory, or elliptic, um, there's this correspondence with algebras um, in quantum integrable systems land. Um, and so, on one hand, in cohomology, there's um, if it's equivariant, you have this fixed point basis that we'll talk about that's pretty easy to define and get a handle on. And that's going to correspond to the hard uh, beta basis in quantum integrable systems. On the other hand, you can define, uh, I guess we'll call it the geometric basis in cohomology, um, like Schubert classes or uh, more general, there are these things called stable envelopes defined by uh, Malik and Akunkov in a uh, huge generality uh, for general Nakajima quiver varieties. Um, but in particular for this talk, we care about them for the cotangent bundle of the flag variety. And so that's not, that's the harder basis on the cohomology side, but it corresponds to the easy basis in the um, lattice model side. And it's so easy that I uh, drew <laughs> a picture of it, right? It'll just correspond to these, um, you know, vectors of colored particles that we use to construct our colored lattice models. Cool, okay. I guess that was just, you know, very general overview, but are there, are there any questions so far? Okay, stop me at any point. Um, so now we'll talk about, um, well, as much equivariant geometry as we um, need to be able to say things. Um, so just a little um, overview. If you have a topological space X and a group gamma, or that's a gamma, right? Or is, yeah, acting on it. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna use G later, so I didn't wanna use G here. Um, so you can take advantage of the symmetry of this group action to, uh, when defining uh, gamma equivariant cohomology. So if your action of gamma is uh, free on X, um, then the definition of the equivariant cohomology is very natural. You just quotient out by gamma and take regular cohomology. Um, if it doesn't act freely, then we're going to modify X uh, to 
be, well, yeah, we're going to modify x to get something contractible. Take, um, so we're going to take any E gamma that is a contractible space with this free um, gamma action. We'll see an example of one of these in a second. And then just take the product of x with that and mod out by the action. Okay, and so the cool, well, one cool thing about um, doing this equivariant theory is that now if you take the cohomology of a point, that'll be um, you know, E gamma mod gamma, and that's not necessarily um, trivial like it is in ordinary cohomology. It's um, non-trivial ring. Um, so back down to Earth. So we're always going to take um, gamma to be a tor maximal torus of uh, GLN, uh, isomorphic to n copies of uh, complex numbers. And so when, in the simplest case, when n is 1, then we can take ET to be these like infinite tuples of complex numbers, finitely many of which are non-zero, um, then that's a contractible space that T acts freely on. Um, and when you quotient out ET by the action of T, we're just getting uh, infinite complex projective space. Um, and, and so we're going to take the cohomology of that to get the cohomology of a point. And um, yeah, I guess I'm taking coefficients in Z, but so that'll just be a polynomial ring with one parameter Y. And for general N, you know, this um, generalizes easily, we get polynomials in N variables. Okay, so we can consider the uh, push forward uh, pi to a point, which um, induces a, um, a pullback, so from the cohomology of a point back to that of x, um, which just gives this cohomology ring the structure of a cohomology of a point module. Oh, I think this is back when I um, didn't decide to switch to gamma. So think of G as gamma or as T. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so um, also, you know, assuming Poincaré duality, we can get a push forward um, to um, a point. And that is what we use to define the Poincaré pairing. So if we want to pair two um, cohomology classes together, we take their cup product and then push them forward to cohomology of a point. Um, so, right, usually in regular cohomology, if your A and B intersect transversely, this is just counting the number of places where they intersect. Um, but now this lives in this um, non-trivial ring. Um, so that was with in regular cohomology. We'll talk a little bit about K theory. Um, and all I'll say is that it's very similar, but now this equivariant K theory ring, um, the um, objects in it are equivariant vector bundles, um, or, you know, if X is nice, uh, that's equivalent to um, equivariant sheaves. Um, and perhaps most relevant for this talk is that now the uh, K-theory of a point is isomorphic to uh, the representation ring of gamma. Uh, so in our case of K-theory, or yeah, of gamma is T, our torus, um, the cohomology of a point is Z, uh, a polynomial ring in Z with coefficients in Z, um, where our variables correspond to um, characters of the torus. 
Okay, so maybe the first hint that this is connected to uh, representation theory at all. Okay, I think that's all I said about, no, it's not, it's not. <laughs> but because here is the big advantage of actually working with the equivariant theories is that um, often they're easier to work with because all of the information about the full cohomology ring is captured by the cohomology of the fixed points, um, which is especially nice if you have finitely many fixed points, uh, as we will for the flag variety. Okay, so now let's get into our examples. So uh, this first example is of the frozen pipes model. And my um, exposition here is heavily influenced by these um, notes of Zin uh lectures from like 2015. They're um, lecture notes that are um, still unfinished, I think, but I have found them super useful. And so I'm basically following them right now. Um, but first, I re recopied this picture of our universe um, just to orient us to like which part of this cube we're talking about here. Um, so the frozen pipes model, I um, guess I didn't do a good job citing things or citing myself at least, but our paper on the archive focuses on this uh, pink highlighted region. So um, the uh, equivariant K theory, connective K theory, and um, cohomology cases, which of course um, can be uh, specialized to the regular cohomology. And also we have um, found that it's pretty easy to extend them to six vertex models as well. But for this talk, we're gonna focus on the simplest case, which is equivariant cohomology. Okay, so now here's uh, G for real is uh, going to be uh, GLN of C. Uh, and our torus is, um, you know, diagonal matrices. The B is the Borel subgroup of upper triangular matrices. And G mod B is the flag variety. And so that's what we're going to take as our space X. Um, then, uh, nice fact, T axon X by conjugation, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, good clarification. Um, so we have a Schubert cell decomposition of the flag variety. Um, So it's this disjoint union of uh, these Schubert cells indexed by um, permutations. Um, you know, there are many ways to define the Schubert cells um, in terms of uh, intersections with the standard flag. And, but I guess the most succinct way is to um, write them as uh, these quotients of double cosets, BWB mod B. Oh yeah, I think that's true, that the conjugation action is the same as left multiplication because of the Borel. Yeah, and then the um, Schubert varieties are just the closures of these cells, um, which we, we can think of them as the disjoint union of the CW, CWs for all of the um, I just, this should be a CV. Oh, never mind. <laughs> of all of the cells with index by permutations less than or equal to W in the Bruja order. Okay, and so the Schubert classes, which are just the cohomology classes of these uh, Schubert varieties, uh, form an additive basis of this cohomology ring. 
Um, so we can think that it's this like geometric uh, basis of the cohomology ring, um, but we also have this um, presentation of it as a quotient of a polynomial ring in two sets of variables. Now we have x's and these y's coming from the fact that we're using this equivariant theory. Um, and so in this isomorphism with the polynomial ring um, or quotient, uh, the Schubert class gets sent to the Schubert polynomial and right um, in K-theory, Grodin-D polynomial, connective K-theory, beta Grodin-D polynomial. Um, but in the equivariant theory, we also have a, for every uh, permutation V and SN, a basis of twisted Schubert classes where we um, act on uh, the Schubert class with our permutation matrix and take that class. Okay, and the T fixed points in this case are going to be the coordinate flags, which I'll call FW, um, which um, are WB mod B, or um, they do correspond to like what you think of as a flag where, um, you know, you take these inclusions of subspaces um, starting with zero acting if like E1, E2, E3 are all the, you know, standard basis elements of C, first you take the W of one um, and so on. So all the basis elements permuted by W and put into a flag. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the part where we use um, these fixed points to, um, handle our cohomology ring, like get a better, like make calculations easier and actually like derive our lattice model. Um, so first we are going to localize our cohomology ring, which I'll denote with a squiggle um, or a tilde. Uh, so that's gonna denote localizing the cohomology ring at the uh, cohomology of a point so just now allowing denominators in this cohomology of a point. And uh, the, it is a theorem that the classes of these fixed points, which I'll now call them, I guess, Yoda sub W, uh, form a basis of this localized ring as a vector space over um, the, um, homology of a point. Okay, so we know it forms a basis, but how do we actually like practically decompose classes in this fixed point basis? Um, another, another big theorem of localization um, says that, okay, so X is our flag variety, so we can write the class of the whole space X as a sum over all fixed point classes. Um, and the denominators end up being the weights of the torus acting on the tangent space at that fixed point. Um, so that's really nice. We take this whole space and we can write it as these, um, you know, in terms of these fixed point classes. Um, so the big question is, how are we going to get a lattice model out of, out of this? Um, so first, let's start off with more lattice uh, objects. So we're going to fix an n-dimensional uh, vector. We'll write it in like the, the ket uh, notation, like bras and kets in physics. Um, or I guess we can think of them as like either side of the Poincaré pairing. It's sort of what, what this is representing. Um, and so if we fix an n-dimensional vector of colors, call it C, we'll think of it as living in an n-fold tensor product. Um, then 
to the permutation of C by W, we associate the Schubert class um, indexed by W. Um, and then uh, if we're denoting the like dual class, the, the bra of the braquette, um, that is going to correspond to the Poincaré dual of the Schubert class, which ends up being this twisted Schubert class by the longest word, W naught. Okay, um, and the Boltzmann weights of the lattice model we build from this will come from the change of basis matrix, um, which I'll suggestively call R uh, sub V between this um, standard Schubert basis and the V twisted one. Okay. Um, and so um, to actually derive these weights, we're going to calculate this change of basis matrix in the case of um, a simple reflection, SI. Okay, so um, to go between these bases, we're, so, we're interested in how, um, I guess these like permutations act on these Schubert varieties. Um, so we're going to start out by um, letting PI be this um, parabolic subgroup where, um, you know, in the I plus first row and the I column, I believe, um, we have an entry and then the rest is just upper triangular. Okay, and then we consider, um, so first let's take the um, product of this parabolic subgroup with um, a Schubert variety XW, uh, quotient out by the action of B on both of these. Um, and then we have two natural projection maps. The first one uh, just down to the Schubert variety, um, the second one down to um, uh, PI mod B. So that'll just be, you know, like you can think of it as getting rid of the upper triangular part. So that's just isomorphic to um, P1. And over here in this simple case, we have two fixed points, um, two torus fixed points. Um, which I'll denote by one and SI, which correspond to like this square being the identity or being this flip map in the I and I plus first entries. Okay, and then over here in P1 where things are nice, um, let's employ that localization formula where we write the whole space P1 in terms of, oh, this should be an SI, not a W. I'll fix that uh, and send these notes back to you, Slava. Um, but yeah, so our two fixed points, one and SI um, over the um, torus weights in this case are going to be YI plus one minus YI and then those flipped around. Uh, so this might remind you of uh, divided difference operators because that's basically what this is. Um, though um, I just want to remark that in general um, this operator is, uh, so this is acting like this is a, a y variable operator and it's uh, uh, Schubert classes and Schubert polynomials are uh, self-dual, but in general, this operator will be dual to the one that's usually defined um, on the X variables to define the Schubert and Grodin polynomials. So an alternative way to get the divided difference operator, but acting in the other set of variables, the equivariant variables. Okay, and so 
Okay, we have this formula in P1 and we're going to pull it back um, or pull it back and then push it forward. So again, looking at this diagram, we're going back and forward uh, to see what this means for um, the Schubert variety. So pulling back these three classes, we get the Schubert variety, um, the simple reflection acting on the Schubert variety, and this uh, parabolic acting on the Schubert variety. Um, and by how the like pullbacks work, um, we only uh, get this if the uh, dimension of X is increased by one by acting on it with PI. Okay, so then just pulling everything that back in this formula and rearranging, we get uh, this equation relating um, the class of the super variety with these classes where SI and PI are acting. Um, and so these are going to correspond to um, the twisted Schubert classes by SI. So this is SW um, twisted by SI. And um, if uh, the, so I guess I'm still thinking of C as my color vector. So if WCI is acting, yeah, the image of the ith color is less than the image of the I plus first color under W, then this is um, the Schubert class twisted by SI indexed by SI acting on W. Okay, so this is only really interesting if um, in the I and I plus first uh, tensor factors where the, um, the colors are, and it depends on the ordering of those colors. Sort of once you unpack all of the different cases, right, we're acting non trivially only on the I and I plus first vector entries. Um, and so we only care about like pairs of colors that could show up there to build our admittedly large R matrix of which this is only a piece. Um, so I'm gonna let blue be less than purple. And so if those are the colors appearing in the i and i plus first spots, then this is what this change of, base, change of basis matrix does um, there. Oh, <laughs> Valentine, that's a great question. Um, and I think I will answer it as my next thing. Yeah, so this is going to be um, the R matrix. I guess if you're not working with Schubert polynomials and you um, have something that's not self-dual, then this will give you the ones acting, the solution to the Yang-Baxter equation acting on the columns or the wherever the Ys are. And it will also be our Boltzmann weights in this case. Um, it'll also give us the row R matrix uh, in this special case. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I've ignored the not, uh, yeah, you're welcome. The not I and I plus first um, entries of the vectors and just focused on like, you know, if there's purple in the ith entry and purple in the I plus first. This is what the matrix looks like. Okay, and this is, yeah, this is going to correspond to the Boltzmann weights we get in the frozen pipes paper with, um, yeah, and this is the most like degenerate case where beta is zero and um, we make our Y parameters there negative. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, and so we can think that this is this vector here and this green circle bit is this vector. And so we get this weight. Um, and there we'll take our row and column parameters to be X and Y. So we get XI minus YJ in the ith row and jth column. Yeah. 
And we also get the R matrix weights this way um, that act on the columns and rows of the model. So by plugging in different uh, um, parameters in, in our matrix. Okay, so I guess the takeaway from that is that, um, well, uh, one, I think it's very cool that we can even like get the weights of the R matrix from doing some geometric process. Um, and also this is um, showing the way of analyzing the lattice model by um, applying operators to Schubert classes, right? We, these uh, change of basis matrices act on our Schubert classes um, like divided difference operators. And so that's one way to get a handle on this model. Um, there's also another way, um, which is using the algebraic beta on sets, um, which I'm only gonna like sketch sort of the idea of it. Um, so we think of one row of a lattice as just being an operator. So if we fix our boundaries, um, we think of it as an operator going from the top to the bottom. And they come in like four flavors, depending on um, you know, what your boundary conditions are. Call them A, B, C, and D. And I guess if you have colors, you can mark them with um, the particular colors that are showing up. Um, and so the, the, the vague idea is that the Yang-Baxter equation uh, gives you commutation relations between these different operators. And these operators and their relations generate um, an algebra, sometimes called a Yang-Baxter algebra. Um, and so this uh, model is a five vertex model. We can sort of think of it as a, um, this algebra giving us a degeneration of the Yangian um, and in other cases um, of quantum groups. And this is a special case of that very general uh, Malik and Akunkov construction. Okay, and so for the, the idea for the beta ansatz is to uh, look at the um, B operators acting on the uh, empty vector. Um, usually in um, this like higher rank colored case, uh, you need to consider the nested beta ansatz, which I'll maybe say a word about later, but I think um, I realized I didn't write this out carefully, but in this case, it um, uh, degenerates to just this. So those B operators acting on the empty vector, we can think of as just building up this square lattice model. Um, and so we haven't specified what the top boundary should be yet, but we've specified the other three. So you look at this and then use the commutations between the operators uh, to find conditions on your, um, in this case, row parameters uh, so that this um, partition function is an eigenvector of the transfer matrix built from the like toroidal uh, boundary condition um, operators. Okay, um, and so that process, uh, you know, that's a little black box here. I'll say, maybe say, uh, or I do have some pictures showing uh, how you might use these commutations uh, to do calculations later. But for now, doing that, um, you find that the row parameters need to be a permutation of the Ys in order for that to happen. Um, and so when we look at this partition function, um, you can also show that this corresponds to the, you know, if we're permuting 
our variables by W, this corresponds to the fixed point class associated to W. Um, and we can think of the partition function as the expansion of the fixed points into the Schubert classes, which are our colored vectors. Um, so just writing that out, right? We expand our fixed point into Schubert classes and um, by Poincaré duality, those, um, since the Schubert classes are uh, self dual, ooh, or maybe one of these should be twisted by something. But in any case, we, the coefficient is the pairing between the Schubert class and the fixed point. Uh, so if we pick a top boundary vector that corresponds to calculating this coefficient, this pairing between the fixed point and the Schubert class in this uh, cohomology of a point, which is this polynomial ring in just the y variables. Okay, and so this will be, you know, so calculating this partition function is calculating the double Schubert polynomial evaluated at these variables. Um, and just represents the Schubert, um, the double Schubert polynomial um, specialized to this fixed point, which determines um, the polynomial itself. Okay, and so we're back at these cartoons finally, um, where just showing this pictorially, we think like, okay, we haven't fixed what the boundary is yet this um, part of the lattice is representing the fixed point associated to W. And then once we pick the boundary, um, it is calculating this Poincaré pairing when we take the partition function. Cool. Yeah, any questions before we talk about Whitaker functions. All right, so now we're gonna uh, do a second example, um, which will involve both the colored and uncolored uh, lattice models for Whitaker functions. And again, to orient ourselves in our uh, cube, um, we'll be up here in the K theory of the cotangent bundle of the flag variety, um, or technically the uh, lattice model itself will just be calculating in the K theory of a point, which um, is isomorphic to the representation ring of the torus. Okay, so before doing anything with Whitaker functions, there's an obligatory uh, notation dump. <laughs> Tried to be as succinct as one could. Um, so now G is going to be GLN over a non-Archimedean field F. I've highlighted all of the like players here. I don't know if that's distracting or helpful, um, but uh, math cal O is the ring of integers of F. Uh, I think this is math frac. P is going to be the maximal ideal of O with this um, generator uniformizer um, pi. The residue field is O mod P, has cardinality Q, and um, oh, lower triangular matrices in O are, is the Iwahori subgroup. And okay, for a complex number Z, um, tau Z is going to be an unramified character of the torus T. And what it does is it takes a torus element, which we can write as a diagonal matrix involving powers of the generator pi, and sends it to Z to the lambda. Um, 
So Z is a tuple of complex numbers and we take each one, each ZI to the lambda I. Okay, and then the principal series representation, which we'll denote by pi um, I of Z. So this is the principal series representation, I guess, associated to this character tau Z. So we get one for each Z. Um, is the induced representation where we um, trivially extend our character to the Borel, um, induce it to G, um, and there's this factor uh, delta to the one half that we won't worry about. Um, so we're inducing our character of the torus. And pi is the right regular action, so of G on this space of functions. Okay, the, and we're gonna focus on the space of Iwahori fixed vectors of the principal series, um, which uh, generates the principal series as a G module. So um, we like to study that. Um, it turns out it has size equal to the cardinality of SN, the symmetric group. Um, and it has two well-known bases that are gonna play a role. Uh, so the standard basis, um, are these functions phi uh, will index by W in SN and uh, still keeping track of Z. Um, these are going to be the characteristic functions on the orbits of the um, this decomposition of G. So combining the Bruja decomposition and the Iwahori um, factorization. Uh, so a natural basis there. There's also Castleman's basis, which we'll denote by FWs. Um, and they're defined to be dual to certain intertwining operators that go between um, the principal series for Z and for W acting on Z. Um, so in other words, um, when we apply this intertwining integral to um, the basis element FV and evaluate it one. Um, that's just the um, Dirac delta. So one if um, W equals V and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's a nice definition, but this, uh, this basis explicitly is hard to, harder to get a handle on. And in particular, the re relationship between it and the standard basis um, is an interesting problem. So back to geometry. Um, a, a cool recent result of Alifi, Mahalsia, Sherman, and Sue uh, de defines an isomorphism, which is called psi, between um, the localized K theory of a flag variety with this extra parameter Q, uh, which we can think of, um, or yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's, maybe I won't say anything here, but <laughs> tensored with um, a copy of C corresponding to the character tau Z. Um, so we have this isomorphism between basically this K theory ring of the flag variety and these Iwahori um, fixed vectors. And in the isomorphism, uh, it sends this, uh, well, dual motivic churn class. And the important point is that it's the Schubert-like thing, the stable envelope basis in the K theory of the cotangent bundle. So before we just had regular Schubert classes, now we have fancier versions um, and they correspond to the standard basis elements. And um, these BWs, which are multiples of the fixed point basis, correspond to Castleman's basis. So yeah, this correspondence between the geometry 
and the piotic representation theory this, this time. And so uh, connecting it to the lattice model is what um, I was interested in, um, especially knowing that there's already this sort of correspondence between um, the different bases in lattice model worlds and geometry. So Brubaker, Bumpf, <laughs> Busimas, and Gustafsson define this colored lattice model that uh, we've seen before that computes the Iwahori Whitaker functions, um, which are just, um, I guess I should have written an extra z to the row, but it, it almost computes these Whitaker functions up to this factor of z to the row. Um, the Whitaker functions just take this Whitaker functional, um, apply it to these standard basis elements, um, acted on by this representation. Um, and we're just gonna look at torus elements here is what this uh, pi to the minus lambda is representing. But anyway, they are represented by um, uh, partition functions of these lattice models that look like this, where the uh, data up top where the colors are is dictated by lambda plus uh, rho, and the colors on the side are dictated by w. Um, and when you take the sum of all the Iwahori Whitaker functions, you get the uh, spherical Whitaker function. Um, so the Whitaker function evaluated on the unique spherical vector. Um, and this spherical Whitaker function is computed by the uncolored Tokuyama lattice model, um, which I think we've also talked about. And so like with the frozen pipes model, there are two ways of analyzing the Tokuyama model, or I mean, there's more than two, but I'm focusing on two right now with the like geometry correspondence in mind. Uh, so one of them is going to correspond to the Schubert-like basis, this motivic churn class, and the other with the uh, fixed point basis. But it's doing so in a different way than we saw in the example of the Schubert polynomials. Okay, which I summarize here. So these two different ways of calculating. The first one is we say, okay, this uncolored model, we know we can compute it by taking a, a sum of the colored partition functions. Um, right, so in this case, we're taking the sum over all of these different colored partition functions um, indexed by W. Um, and we calculate those using the demeser whitaker operators via the train argument. So I like, I like to think of this as the macro Yang-Baxter equation proof where, you know, you attach an R matrix on one side, scooch it through, um, and that's computing the action of these operators. Um, yeah, and so using this correspondence um, in this paper I mentioned, uh, this, um, doing this calculation this way is, has this following geometric interpretation as well. Now we're summing over these Poincaré pairings in equivariant K-theory between um, a line bundle indexed by lambda plus rho and um, a multiple of this dual motivic churn class. Um, and so this is defining, I guess, sort of like, you know, modified normalized uh, motivic churn class, which we can sum up and get um, the line bundle paired with churn class, which will turn out to uh, correspond to the, a modified spherical vector that we are applying the Whitaker functional to. But on the other hand, we can, um, analyze or compute the um, 
partition function of the uncolored model using a method inspired by the algebraic beta onsets that we talked about earlier. Um, and this is very similar to um, uh, Bordin and a result of Bordin and Petrov from 2016. Um, so very similar method. Um, and I think of this as the micro yang baxter equation proof because it goes more into the meat of the like inside of the lattice model rather than just acting um, globally. Well, there are some pictures, I think, on the next slide of that. And so what results from using this method is a vile, is the vile character like formula for the Whitaker function. Um, again, it's a it's a sum over the, um, the vile group, the symmetric group. Um, but now um, we have z to the w lambda plus rho. We have um, these um, factors out front. And what this translates to in the geometry is the expansion into um, the fixed point basis, which corresponded to the Castleman basis in representation theory. Okay. Oh, maybe it's not this slide, it's the next one. But uh, the way you prove these geometric interpretations is you do very careful formal geometric manipulations and convention matching between papers. Um, and if you're me, you do them multiple times because you are not very careful as a person in general. <laughs> um, and so from just doing this lattice model calculation two ways, you can extract this expansion of this, well, uh, modified spherical vector into um, the Castleman basis and, uh, you know, and its corresponding geometric version. Um, so that's a cool result. And also we can, you know, um, uh, now, at least with the like motivic turn class side, the left side of that, um, of my chart, we can draw similar cartoons for the Iwahori and spherical vectors, where now we're pairing with these motivic turn classes, um, and we think of picking, you know, the color vector, or in this case, just the solid color vector, which is a sum of all the colors, as um, whatever is Poincaré dual to um, these, which we could figure out, but I, I didn't for this talk. So sort of like right, a similar, a similar picture to um, the frozen pipes example, but now we're like pairing with this line bundle. Um, the fixed points aren't immediately obvious, um, but here is how the fixed points come about. Um, they're going to correspond to um, these uh, powers of Z, these monomials. <laughs> um, and so in the very, very simplest case, um, the algebraic beta onsets type method works like this. So, right, I just chose a two by two, very, very simple case. And then you extrapolate to bigger ones. But the idea is that you take each state of the model. So in this case, there's only two. Um, and in general, you can come up with a general pattern. So you don't actually have to go through each state. Um, but we think of each vertex as being one of those operators. So like this single vertex here is a B operator because it's uh, uncolored on one side, colored on the other. Um, and we can use the Yang-Baxter commutations to commute the columns separately from one another. So we're not really getting a, uh, a state of the lattice model anymore once we do this. Um, but you commute them until all the A operators and D operators are below the Bs. Um, so in this case, we commuted, um, we didn't have to do anything to this this one, but we commuted B and D, and that swapped our spectral parameters. Um, and the reason why we do this is because the A's and D's acting on the um, 
the empty vector um, are easy to calculate. They, um, yeah, and so in this case, you know, we get whatever the factor is from the commutation um, times, uh, in this case, we only get a non-trivial weight in this model from this factor, which is Z1, and that in this case, it's Z to the identity applied to lambda plus rho. Um, and then we do that for the one other state, and we get Z to the W naught acting on lambda plus rho. So this is just S2, so that's, that's it. That's how we get the expansion. Okay, I know I'm running, or I've already run out of time, but um, in terms of future directions, uh, the first thought I had was initially I um, hoped there would be a nice lattice model proof of the bump Nerus Nakasuji conjecture, um, which describes the expansion of, oh, this should be, uh, yeah, like a capital C, but the standard basis into the Castleman basis. So what I described earlier was um, just the spherical vector in terms of the Castleman basis, but what about all these Iwahori um, standard bases, um, which is a harder problem <laughs> for sure. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to have a lattice model proof of it. Um, I think in theory, it should be, we could, should be able to extract it from a formula of Borodine and Wheeler, um, which they obtain by the nested beta ensembles. Um, so just stealing some pictures from their paper, um, where now instead of like the beta vectors just being, you know, look at your square lattice, there's, we now have this, this waterfall um, and we analyze that and it gives us a um, symmetrization formula in their case for the non-symmetric Hall Littlewood polynomials over, well, over all of the symmetric groups. Um, uh, so since these non-symmetric Hall Littlewood polynomials specialize to or up to some factors to the Iwahori Whitaker functions. I'm like, I guess technically we should be able to um, see that this is some sum over fixed points um, and like extract the um, coefficients from there, but it wouldn't be immediately apparent. I haven't tried to do it. Um, like for example, we would need to collapse this whole inner sum over all the smaller symmetric groups uh, to figure out what the coefficient of the fixed point is, um, and therefore the coefficient of the Castleman basis. Um, so that's that's one thing that could be investigated. But I feel like this perspective should be um, useful in other ways. And so I was wondering if you know if anyone else has any ideas then let me know. But that's all I have. Okay, let's thank Katya. So since you mentioned the uh, uh, bump Nakasuji Naruse uh, conjecture, which was proved by Alufi, yeah. Halchia, uh, Sherman, and Sue, there's a generalization of, of, of that now. Um, and, and there is mm -hmm. a, 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 a um, so, so the, um, uh, the the con the conjecture originally was that you take the the Iwahori fixed vector, you apply the intertwining operator, and then you evaluate at the at the at the identity, and then depending upon whether a Schubert uh, variety is non-singular, this has a nice expression similar to the Gindik and Karpolevich formula. So instead of evaluating it at the identity, you can simply pair it with another Iwahori vector, and you get you get a, something that depends upon um, three uh, Wilder elements. And uh, very often that looks like the uh, um, uh, again the Karpolevich formula times a um, uh, times a polynomial which uh, has po po a polynomial in Q, independent of the spectral parameters. And and uh, we don't we don't know exactly what the conditions should be for for uh, there to be a Ginnikan-Karpolevich-like formula for that. 
um, uh, we do know that if you fix the two Iwahori vectors, except that they're in, in, in different representations, and then you vary the, the intertwining operator, um, that there's a minimal in an intertwining operator that gives you a non-zero pairing. And then, uh, and then interestingly, um, uh, when you do that, the, 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 uh, you have something which is independent of the spectral parameters. So, um, uh, and in fact, you can prove that it's a Poincaré polynomial, the Bruja interval. So, um, so um, if you're looking at giving an, um, a, a new proof of the uh, uh, original conjecture, you might be able to uh, generalize it. I can send you a preprint. It should be in the archive in a few days. Oh yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I know. I was like, this has already been proven and in like more generality than GLN, but it would be cool to see it in the lattice model too. But it, it'd be even cool to prove something bigger. <laughs> yeah, thank you.